Yeah, start one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. And I think we're good. We can see my screen. We can hear me talking, and uh, we're starting the recording. So we remembered all our housekeeping items. Um, okay, we're going to talk about MIPS. Always such an exciting topic. I need to, this never wants to move ahead. Let's see if we can get it to do this and then we'll start again. All right, here's our agenda for today. Um, I always like to review the basics of macro QPP and MIPS just because um, I think you can never repeat the details enough, but we're gonna blow through it pretty fast. So um, if, you, if you need more, um, go look up our past webinars to get the deeper dive, but I'll do a brief summary. Uh, we will also review what tools are available within the Glowstream product to help you be successful with MIPS. Um, we're going to have a new conversation about determining your participation status for 2017. Um, also, look into group reporting. I'm going to help you all understand what group reporting is about. Um, and it, it, it's never too soon to think about an audit, right? What happens if we get audited? Let's make sure we're preparing now for an audit. Gosh forbid that should happen. Um, there's also a hardship exemption I want to talk about. Um, we'll get into the details of that. And then um, let's talk a little bit about um, the shades of things to come, what's, uh, what's on the proposal for uh, 2018. All right, so here's the slide you've all seen before, right? Um, MACRA is the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act. It was passed in 2015. Um, the quality payment program is part of MACRA, and the quality payment program is broken into advanced APMs and MIPS. Most of us are participating in MIPS. Um, not a lot of people are out there in the advanced APM. Then there's this little pocket of, of folks that are considered MIPS APM clinicians. Those are the, the folks in the track one MSSPs. Those folks are considered MIPS APM clinicians, and they kind of live in both worlds. Um, the ACO reports quality and CPIA for them, and um, they, they have to, those MIPS APM clinicians are responsible for the ACI portion only. So um, super fast. Um, we, we show the, um, the different ways to participate in an advanced APM, right? Those are the oncology care model, CPC+. Plus, those MSSP tracks two and three, uh, one plus will come into place in 2018, and then the new generation um, ACOs. If you're participating in MIPS, which most of our clients are, uh, the three performance categories for the 2017 reporting year are quality, ACI, and CPIA. Um, and then we throw cost in there because it's, it's looming. One of these days, they're gonna make us responsible for cost, and that's gonna be a fourth performance category. Uh, but that's not true for 2017, and, and they're even taking it off the table for 2018, but we'll talk about that at the end. Um, all right, so who's eligible, right? These are all the eligible. Um, again, we've talked about this a bunch of times, but this, it's your physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and certified registered nurse anesthetists. You also um, have to, or you, you, are, you are required to participate if you bill more than 30,000 Medicare and provide care to more than 100 Medicare Part B patients per year. Um, if you're gonna report individually and you're one of those um, um, mid-level providers, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, et cetera, um, and you didn't traditionally per participate in meaningful use, um, CMS will actually reweight your ACI category to zero and throw those 25 points into the quality performance category. So important to understand um, based on uh, your credentials which route you participate in MIPS. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, near the end as well. I always like to talk about the reputational impact of your MIPS composite score, right? We're going to take those three performance categories. ACI, quality, and CPIA. We're going to mush them all together and out comes your final MIPS composite score. Um, yes, it's going to determine if you pay a penalty or receive an incentive bonus, um, but it's also going to uh, be published on the Physician Compare website so folks can get out there and, and take a look at your quality. So um, more than just a financial reason to participate in MIPS. Um, 
Okay, so this is that slide that kind of breaks down the different performance categories, right? Um, we have the quality performance category, which is the one that replaces PQRS, and it counts for 60% of your MIPS composite score. Uh, the improvement activities, which is a new concept, and that counts for 15% of your MIPS composite score. Advancing care information that we fondly refer to as ACI because we're in medicine and we love acronyms. Um, that replaces the Meaningful Use Program and accounts for 25% of your MIPS composite score. Cost is the one, is the performance category that replaces the value-based payment modifier. Um, and again, keeping in mind that that is not, uh, you're not being scored on cost in 2017 and in 2018 proposed rule, they are also talking about um, not counting cost yet. So a little bit of good news for us. We're kind of comfortable with with these three performance categories as is. Okay, so what tools can you expect from TriArc? Um, we've got our, as we did with Meaningful Use um, and the clinical quality measures that were part of Meaningful Use, we've got dashboards within the product. So the MIPS dashboards are three. One is the quality dashboard, right? This is, the, this is all those um, eCQMs that folks um, used for, um, the CQM portion of meaningful use, and also could use for PQRS reporting. Um, the ACI dashboard, the 2017 ACI transition dashboard, that's the one you'll use this year. And then in years forward, we will use the ACI dashboard, which is really for 2018 plus. That's the one based on 2015 edition certification, which is what we are currently working on. Um, so for now, you're gonna worry about just the quality dashboard, and the 2017 ACI dashboard. All right, what do those dashboards look like? Here's the ACI dashboard. Um, you've hopefully seen this. Um, in 8091, we gain a little bit of, um, just, just a little more insight into the base measures. Um, what I want you to take away from the screen you're looking at right now is, um, notice in the column labeled base that I have circled in red there. There's a red check next to the security analysis. Um, this is meant to, to be a warning to you that, hey, you, you've not yet satisfied this measure, right? We know there's four, four measures that roll up into the base score. You have to do your security risk analysis. You have to e-prescribe for one patient. You have to provide patient access for one patient. And you have to do health information exchange for one patient. If you don't meet that one patient or do your security risk analysis by indicating yes in your numerator dropdown, then you'll have a red check. So we want it to be really obvious to you if you've failed to meet those. Um, the other takeaway from this screen is that um, if you don't meet the base score, those 50 automatic points are all or nothing. If you don't meet those four measures for the base score, not only do you not get those 50 points, you don't get your performance points either. So our dashboard shows you what your performance points will be if you meet your base score. So I don't want that to be misleading to anybody. Right now we're saying your ACI category would be 10.75 and really it should say zero because you're gonna get no points at all if you don't meet the base score. Um, so we're gonna assume these people are gonna meet the base score. We're gonna add our 50 to 43 and we're gonna get a 93. Um, and that will give us a 23.25 out of a possible 25 in this performance category towards our MIPS composite score, which is gonna be really good. So um, the moral of this story is here, there is a lot available to you points-wise in the performance category. Uh, there's 80 points there, you only need 50 of them. So lots of room for extra credit. Um, and uh, we're looking for some nice high ACI scores out of our folks and don't miss the base. Okay, the quality dashboard. Um, there are some new, uh, new filters at the top of this report that are geared toward group reporting. So um, we're gonna talk about group reporting in depth, but what you see at the top are a bunch of filters that let me um, sort this by different um, populations and also to generate a score at the TIN level, the tax ID level. Um, what else we're doing on this screen, we try to give you on-screen feedback regarding the category of the uh, quality measure itself. So what's a high priority, what's cross-cutting, what's outcome. 
And then that little warning message that I'm showing here is letting me know I tried to save my dashboard without picking six measures. So that's the minimum. That's the, what you need to report for quality in 2017. You need to pick six measures. If you try to close, run this dashboard and close it without six measures, it's going to let you know, hey, you didn't pick as, as many as you need to. And don't forget, you need at least one outcome measure or another high priority measure. So um, we're trying to give you some on-screen tips about not missing out. Um, and then obviously the numerators, denominators, percentages are displaying here as well. All right. Um, okay, so what happens if your, your numerators aren't what you want them to be? Um, you need to know what you need to be doing in the system to be more successful. So this, there's a lot happening on this screen, so I'm going to try and walk you through it. If I were to double click, so I'm going to go back up one screen. If I were going to double click on, on one of these lines, let's pretend I have numerators and denominators here. If I double click, this is the feedback I'm going to get. The top half of this screen, so this is for the, the new pneumonia vaccination for older adults. Um, we're trying to show you what is causing the system to increment numerators and denominators. Um, we don't get to make the decisions about what makes the dashboard move. This is part of our certification. We have to pass rigorous testing. Um, we have to build this based on the specs that are provided by CMS. Um, but we want you to understand what those specs are. Um, there are pages and pages and pages. We try to distill it down to something that's manageable so you can actually act upon this feedback. So what we're seeing at the very top is it's showing me um, anything that's in gray is, hey, that's what landed the patient in the denominator. And I will tell you most often it's going to be a, a, an office visit CPT code. So that means you saw the patient. Um, for this one, it's, it's they're over 65 years old. And then what you see in green is what's causing the numerator to increment. Oh, okay, there's a CPT code for the Pneumovax shot, the 90732. Or there's a SNOMED code that's present in the patient record, which we can handle via, um, we, can, we can tie that to a history item. So you can document in history, the patient had this done 10 years ago. And we're going to find that 12866006 SNOMED code. And we're going to say, oh, ding, 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 you, you got credit for, for that patient having had their pneumovax. Or the CVX codes, 133 and 33, are the two that are tied to um, the different um, pneumonia vaccination immunizations. So if you use our immunizations module and you administer that um, vaccination, that CVX code automatically becomes part of the patient record and the numerator goes up. Um, so at the bottom half of the screen, uh, where the, that, of that top section where it shows patients meeting the criteria and patients who did not meet the criteria. Okay, so at the patient level, show me what's lacking. Show me what worked and what didn't work. Um, in the, in who, the, the, the patient that I've circled in green, when I, when I click on that little blue eye, that little tool tip, that takes me to the details for this patient. And sure enough, that patient counted because the um, pneumovax, uh, the pneumonia vaccination, SNOMED code is in the patient's history because we tied that to a history item that we use when we are seeing our patients and we say, yep, they've had their vaccination. On the other side, we call it the bad side, so the folks that are in the unique patient scene who do not meet the objective criteria, so all those people that are circled in red over there, what's going on? What's lacking? So at the top of the screen, we show patient lacking following conditions. And we show you all the different ways you might have captured, um, you know, to let us know that that patient has had their pneumovax shot. Um, so this is in place for every one of the quality measures. Okay, lots going on here. Also on that screen, um, at the very top, there's a, a hyperlink that says click here for help. Well, if you click here for help, we will take you immediately to the quick guide for that particular quality measure. And this is sort of the deeper dive into, you know, an explanation of, you know, why does, you know, what, what's the initial patient population, um, what causes the numerator to increment, kind of a high level description of the workflow. And then we like to show you screenshots as well of how you might go about capturing that. So um, that's also embedded within the quality measures dashboard. Okay, 
more online help. So via our help that you get through the help menu, um, it's also available via, available via the F1 uh, function key throughout the product. You can get to these quick guides. We have a couple different flavors of quick guides. The original quick guides were um, lots and lots and lots and lots of data, right? We tried to show you every single CPT code or ICD-10 code or SNOMED or LOINC, et cetera, all the codification that's required to move your numerators and denominators. Um, that was a little TMI, so we tried to simplify those and get, get it distilled down to a one or two page workflow, you know, a sample workflow of what would increment numerator denominator and included some uh, screenshots. So there's two different flavors. Um, this is an example of the uber detailed one. So you can see for colonoscopy, we're showing you the, you know, long, long list of, you know, I shouldn't say for cult, for the colorectal cancer screening, right? You can meet this measure by doing a fecal occult blood test. Well, how does the system know you did that? Oh, there's a LOINC code. It's on the box. Go find your testing kit and look for the LOINC code. Make sure you've got that in your, um, in your test master in orders and results setup. You want to tie that LOINC code. So every time you document against a, you document a fecal occult blood result, that LOINC code is being added to your patient record and your colon cancer numerators are going up. You can also document um, the colonoscopy, SNOMED codes, CPT codes, a flexible sigmoid. So we show you all those codes that um, CMS has said, oh, these codes mean to me that you're doing what you need to to, to, to uh, screen these folks for colon cancer. Here's a sample of the simplified quick guide we were descri describing. So the same, the same um, colon cancer measure, and this is what we call the simplified workflow quick guide. So those are available in online help as well. And then just in case you didn't think that was enough feedback, this is the actual CMS documentation. So from the horse's mouth, here it is. That's also available to you in, in the product. All right. Oh, new feature, Q checkpoint. Um, we like to call this the Anders Lundberg feature. This is something in discussion with my husband, who is the poor thing, subjected to way too much of what I do for a living. He's like, you know, do you ever, do you ever warn the doctor at the end of the, the visit, you know, what he didn't do that he might have done to, you know, get his scores higher? And I'm like, uh, no, but, but duh, what a great idea. <laughs> so um, we implemented this. And it's real-time feedback within the exam itself. You hit that little icon called Q checkpoint, and it's going to show me for this patient how, which, what, what are the measures this patient qualified for in the, in the denominator. So they meet that initial patient population for this measure or this group of measures. And then the green or red is letting me know, hey, did we do what we were supposed to to get the numerator to increment? Um, this screen has also the all the same feedback I just showed you from the main quality measures dashboard, but it was obviously very specific to this particular patient. So this looks just like the CQM dashboard, but it's for only this patient, for only the measures that that you um, that you can be successful with this patient. So um, I like to call this kind of a missed opportunities, right? Let's make sure that that we document what we need to. You might look at this and say, oh shoot, forgot to do the fall risk for this guy. I'm gonna zoom in there and do that right now. So look for this new feature in 8090. Um, okay, that was a really fast breeze through what's available inside Glowstream. Um, I wanna talk with you about this 2017 participation status. Um, this was something that um, CMS I don't know the exact date. I want to say sometime in March. Uh, it was in the springtime. Folks ought to have been receiving letters in their practice. So there were two, there's two ways you can learn about your, your MIP participation. Um, they sent out letters that educated you and said, hey, here's your TIN, here's your provider name, and here's what we are expecting from you this year. Either you do need to report or you fell, um, you, you, you didn't meet the threshold for participating. Um, so all, a lot of different categories of, you know, do you need to do this or not? 
if you didn't see this letter or you can't find it or you didn't know what it meant when it was sent to you, it's not too late, you didn't miss out, you can go to the QPP website and really you can't miss this MIPS participation status um, icon. They have embedded it like everywhere you go on that website, you run into this, check your status, check your status. So you type in your NPI, you hit check now, and you're gonna get feedback that's gonna look like this. So our, our provider on the left is someone who, so Trapper John MD is included in MIPS. He's got a report this year. Uh, Marcus Welby over on the right, um, he is not required to submit data to MIPS for 2017 for the practice listed below. Notice there, um, if, you're, if you participate or if you're linked to multiple tax ID numbers, it will give you feedback per tax ID number. Um, so anyway, very, very important. Make sure that you fully understand if you are, if, if they're going to be looking for you to send them uh, MIPS data this year. Okay. Okay, group reporting. We've learned a lot about group reporting. CMS um, did a nice webinar on this. I can't say enough about um, how, how well they have um, documented requirements you know, I think they really understand how confusing MIPS is for folks, and um, I really personally get a lot out of their webinars. I can't say enough about them. Um, the recordings are out there. If you don't get the real-time invite, I, I encourage you to go watch their webinars. They do a fantastic job. So they presented for about an hour and a half on this concept of group versus individual. I'm going to try and distill it down for you um, to help you make a good decision. So here's kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of individual versus group reporting. Um, if you report as an individual, your payment adjustment will be based on your performance alone. So um, if you're a superstar uh, and, and, and you know, you're a solo practitioner, whatever, you are, you're judged based on your performance and your performance alone. Um, in the 2017 reporting year, um, the ways that you will be able to submit data are listed here. Um, I've highlighted electronic health record and attestation because those are our recommendations. Um, EHR, that you will be sending your quality measure dashboard to our DA3 report. You'll directly submit that to CMS and you'll get six bonus points, one for each measure that you report using end-to-end -end electronic data submission. Um, so we've highlighted that one, as well as attestation, uh, just like you did for meaningful use. You will report your uh, clinical practice improvement activities and your um, ACI categories via attestation. So very much like we did for MU. So those are the two uh, that we, we expect our folks will use. Okay, what if I want to report as a group? So what does this mean? Uh, each eligible clinician participating in MIPS via a group will receive a payment adjustment based on the group's performance. And by a payment adjustment, we mean either positive or negative, so a penalty or an incentive. So whatever payment adjustment, you'll all, you'll sink or swim together. If you report as a group, you will be scored as a group with one single MIPS composite score. Uh, what is the definition of a group? A single tax ID with two or more eligible cl clinicians, including at least one MIPS eligible clinician, as identified by their NPIs who have reassigned their medical billing rights to the TIN. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's at the tax ID level. Uh, there are additional reporting methods available if you report as a group. Um, in addition to those that were listed for individuals, there's the CMS web interface that's only available if you are 25 or more clinicians in your group, or the CAPS for MIPS survey, um, only available to groups with two or more eligible clinicians. Um, and the CAPS for MIPS survey is really, it's, it's, a, it's a way to do a, get additional points. I don't think too many people are going down that road. Um, so suffice it to say, essentially, the um, the reporting mechanism is going to be the same for the two. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the data submission methods. And this is really not unique to groups. This is true if you're going to report as an individual. So the QCDR, Qualified Clinical Data Registry, um, it's, it's a way to um, set, submit your data. Um, a qualified registry 
uh, again, a different way, another way to submit your data using a registry. So you would you would go out, a lot of you probably um, participated in PQRS through a registry. Um, those would be the qualified re registries that are out there. Um, we are focused more on EHR, right? Eligible clinicians submit data directly through the use of an EHR system that is considered certified EHR technology, CEHRT, right? Glowstream is currently uh, 2014 edition certified. We're working on our 2015 edition certification. Um, but if you are using your EHR, you can directly submit. And that's what most of you will do for quality. That would be our recommendation for quality. Um, attestation, again, just like we did for meaningful use. Um, this, is, this is you attesting that you did um, that what you're telling them you did, you actually did, and then you would, you know, want to have some documentation to support that if you ever got audited, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then administrative claims, right? That's a lot of us uh, participated in PQRS via claims, right? So you are, you know, picking a, a HICS-PICS code, a CPT2 code, a QDC, call it whatever you will. Um, you, you, you indicated what the patient's BMI was or whether or not you um, had, you know, counseled them against smoking. You used those HICS-PIX codes on your claims to report for PQRS. That is still available. Um, interesting note here at the bottom, it's not necessary to select the same submission method for all performance categories. So you can use, um, you can use your EHR to submit your quality dashboard directly and get those six bonus points. And then you can do attestation for the other two. So there are there are different perform there are different submission methods for different performance categories. However, within the same category, so let's use quality as our example. You can't say I'm going to submit three quality measures via my my EMR's quality dashboard, and then I'm going to do three uh, via claims. You cannot use a different submission methods within the same performance category. But in 2018 they are proposing that they allow us to do that, which is pretty cool. We like the increased flexibility. Um, okay, so back to this group participation, how are payment adjustments applied? I think we all get the message here, but let's let's really beat this into the group. Um, you will get, you will be scored as a group and you will sink or swim as a group. Um, your MIPS payment adjustment is going to be um, uh, CMS assigns the MIPS payment adjustments to the combination of the TIN slash NPI, regardless of whether performance was measured at the individual or group level. Any individual included in the TIN but excluded from MIPS because they are identified as a new Medicare enrolled clinician, a QP, a partial QP, those QPs are, um, those are the, the advanced APM folks. They would not receive a MIPS adjustment um, regardless of their MIPS participation. So, um, the takeaway here, and I'm going to do a little, I'm going to do a little um, case study for you to try and really bring this home for us. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that even if, so I, we, we've had questions like this from, from some of our larger practices who maybe you've got, you've got nurse practitioners and PAs. You've got um, folks who work in the hospital. They never come into the office. They don't see patients in the, in the office. Um, but they're part of your TIN and they have to report. And then you've got those folks would all be covered if you report at the TIN level. Everybody's covered, everybody gets the same score. Um, so I really think group participation is the way to go. Um, for those of you who've, who've participated in these incentive programs in the past, you know um, how labor intensive it is to do this at the individual clinician level. Um, Group participation is just, I think it's going to be far simpler if you can get everybody to participate and, and everybody has the same level of commitment so you don't have your poor performers dragging down your good performers. Um, okay, so here's a little case study I wanted to talk about. All right, so this practice has five docs. They all have to participate in all three categories. They've got one guy who's new to their practice. He actually, if I type, when I type his NPI in, he does not need to participate this year because he is new to Medicare. They have four PAs. If we reported individually, we would only report quality and CPIA, and our quality dashboard would count for 85% of their score, and their CPIA would count for 15% for those PAs. 
Then we've got four physical therapists that don't have to participate in 2017. Okay, so now what does group reporting look like for this group? We're gonna go in and we're gonna run the quality measures dashboard at the TIN level, right? That one, that setting we showed you where you just you pick all, you type in the TIN, you're gonna generate a single QRDA3 file and we're gonna, we're gonna upload that to CMS at the end of the year or in January. So I got one dashboard for that, however many providers there are, 10 providers here, not 10 individual dashboards, one dashboard. Then I'm gonna run the ACI transition dashboard for each individual, MD, not the PAs. I don't have to worry about the PAs. I only have to worry about the docs. And um, another bonus here is because this is at the group level, those trickier to meet measures in particular, the health information exchange, right, where you have to do that summary of care upon transitions of care, and it's hard to find their direct address, and you do one of those to meet the base score, guess what, that one applies to the entire practice. So I don't have to do one for each doc, I just need to do one for the entire practice. So that makes that easier for me. Um, at this time, we do not have the ability to run our ACI dashboard at the group level. We're working on that. I expect to have that for you in version nine. What we're gonna give you is the ability to multiply select. So you can just pick the people that you really, that you need to be including in that. Um, but for now, if I run it for the individual providers, then I'm gonna total up their numerators, total up their denominators, and I'm gonna get a single um, percentage for each measure. And that's gonna be my um, ACI dashboard at the practice level. And that's what I'm gonna use for my attestation. Then I'm going to do my CPIA, right? Don't let's not forget about this clinical practice improvement activity um, category. I'm going to do that for the group and submit that via attestation. And then everybody in the group is going to get the same MIPS composite score. All right. So this is kind of belaboring what that would look like, the group reporting from the ACI category. So um, this looks a little bit like our ACI dashboard. I did this in a spreadsheet. Um, so I've got each of the, the measures, the ones that are in red are the ones required for the base score. And then I've got the numerators for each doctor and then a total, the denominators for each doctor and a total. And then the percent is the total numerator divided by the total denominator. And then that translates into my performance points. So I'm gonna get, I've got, um, I've got at least one doctor who's met each of the four base scores. So I'm gonna get my 50 points there. My performance points are totaling 41, so we're going to get 91 out of 100 for a max. Uh, so we're going to get 23 of 25 points for this um, this category. So the 25 points that go towards um, the 100 for your MIPS composite score, I'm going to get 23 out of 25. So that's pretty good. We're happy about that. Um, all right. So this is this is sort of just summarizing. Um, the MIPS composite score for this, this little sample practice we just talked about. Um, so I gave them a, they got a 23 for ACI as a group. They got 35 points for quality. Um, CPIA is 15, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. So make sure you, you meet your CPIA. Um, take a look at all those different options available to you. The CMS website does a nice job describing each. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about um, what kind of documentation they might be looking for for, from you. So my total here is 73 in my little fictional world here. Um, I like that number because it's over 70. And why is 70 a magic number? There is this concept of the exceptional performance bonus. Exceptional performers will receive an additional positive adjustment factor and they will pull from a pool of up to 500 million, which is available in addition to what they've allocated for MIPS, there's an additional exceptional performer bonus that will be distributed among that 500 million that's available each year from 2019 to 2024. So um, obviously all this work we're doing in 2017, we won't see the benefits of this or the, or the negative impact of this until the 2019, um, the 2019 payment year. So that's why we like to see a high score. It's not just financial, but it's also um, reputational. Okay. So here, I, I'm, I'm trying to beat this into you that I think group reporting is the way to go. So let's summarize. All performance categories must be reported either as a group 
or as an individual. So it's all or nothing. You can't report ACI individually and then quality as a group. You got it. It's, it's, a, it's an all or nothing. You can choose different submission mechanisms for each category, but you have to use the same submission method within a given category. So we've said that already a couple of times. Um, and we always use quality as our example there. You can't send some via claims and others via EHR. But yay, it's going to change next year, we believe. The reporting period, I thought this was nice as well. It's not required to be the same for all performance categories. Um, you want to aggregate your data prior to submission, so there'll be a single numerator and a single denominator per measure for ACI and quality. Um, even if the provider does not contribute to the ACI numerator and denominator, so right, these are those hospital-based providers that are in your group, they can still be included in the group. Um, so non-patient facing providers are included in the TIN, but they may or may not contribute to the numerator or denominator. So you'll have to do your own research on, on you know, which bucket your practice provide, uh, falls into there. Um, groups have the option to report at the individual or group, but not both. Um, this is kind of interesting. If you report as a group, then the group is required to aggregate the data across the TIN and will be assessed and scored across all performance categories across the entire TIN. I think we get it, right? It's one score for the group. Everybody gets the same score. Okay, audits. We hate to think about these, but they are a fact. Um, some of our folks have been audited for meaningful use. Um, if you've had, you know, we'd, like to, we'd like to provide suggestions Anybody that I've worked with in, in the MU world, we always talk to you about your MU audit folder. Make sure you're preparing for the audit. Do it now in case, you know, let's hope it doesn't happen, but if you get audited, what are they gonna be looking for? So this is not the end all be all. These are suggestions. Um, I highly encourage you all to do your own homework here, um, but these are just, you know, at a bare minimum, these are some things I think you ought to be thinking about. Um, so quality, right? It's the most important category. It counts for 60%. Job one is print your dashboard and just keep it handy. Um, so you want to have a have have a hard copy of your MIPS quality measures dashboard, and it will it already shows what are the high priority measures. So um, you also want to have some documentation. Um, demonstrating your direct EHR submission to attain those bonus points, right? We all want those extra six bonus points for the end-to-end -end electronic submission. Uh, the best thing I can think of here is, is do screenshots of you uploading that file to CMS. Um, and then if you're reporting as a group, really you want to you keep some documentation. Remember, this is 2017. You're gonna, you're gonna, in 2019 is, is when the, I think when the audit, well, they might start in 2018. Let's just suffice it to say, you might not remember who was in your group in 2017 when you sat down to do reporting. Let's have that documented somewhere. Just, just keep track of it somewhere so you know who you, who you called as part of your TIN when you submitted this, if you do, if you're reporting as a group. Um, improvement activities, right? This is that new category, remember that. Um, so what are some of the ways we are successful in, a, in, in meeting the improvement activities? If you're a PCMH, you automatically qualify and you don't have to do something new and different for the IA category. Retain your documentation that proves your PCMH designation. Throw that in your MIPS audit folder. Same story goes for the ACO. If you're participating in the MSSP or next gen ACOs, you automatically qualify for the 15 points retained documentation to prove your ACO participation. You want to um, provide proof to support that your EMR is certified. Um, if you go out to the, um, the chapel website, CHPL, you can find Glowstream out there. You can print a document that's it's like a certificate. It gives the, you know, the number that you submit. Our, our certification ID, et cetera. Um, so you, it's easy to prove that you um, were using a certified EMR. You want to retain a copy of successful submission report. So um, remember when we were attesting for meaningful use, at the end of, of, the, of the whole thing, there were like five places where you had pricked your finger and, you know, put the blood on the screen that, yes, yes, I swear this is all true. And, you know, yes, yeah, so you, at the very end, 
And I, my favorite part is when they move the buttons, the successful move forward buttons, they move them from the right to the left. So just in case you, you know, aren't paying attention, you could really screw it up. Uh, but you get to the end of that screen and there is a document you, you can push print and there's your proof that you successfully submitted. Definitely do that and save it. Um, and then I think as far as your improvement activities, for those of you who are, are going to be using um, the CMS list of suggested improvement activities, so you're not a PCMH, you're not an NACO, you have to do this. Um, you know, there have been a lot of questions. Well, what, what are they looking for? Like, we, we get that it's attestation, but I don't really have like a dashboard like I did for meaningful use. I don't have a dashboard like I have for ACI. What are they going to, you know, how do I prove that I did what I'm attesting to? Um, there, most of the CPIAs, and again, do your own research here, I think most of them can be handled with an inter internal policy plan, procedure, something that you've documented that says, this is our, our practice policy. Um, if you're going to do, so I'd like to give this example here. Our favorite CPIA is um, the one that is the provide 24 by 7 access to MIPS eligible clinicians, groups, or care teams for advice about urgent and emergent care. Okay, so what is this? I'll break down to. We like this one because it's high priority, so you only have to do one of them, right? You have to do either one high priority or two mediums for the CPIA category. Um, we also like that it gets you bonus points in the ACI because you're using your EMR to satisfy. Um, so why are you using your EMR here? Well, um, I'm giving my patients access to my providers through the portal. Um, so I'm gonna need a policy that describes um, how is access enabled to the patient? Um, what are my expected response times? Maybe you wanna print your calendar that shows you've got you know, patients that are being seen outside of normal business hours, or perhaps you've got a template that is reserving um, for same day emergency appointments. So um, screenshots of your, of your Glowstream environment that prove how you are working towards um, meeting this improvement activity. Um, and here I've got the example of your patient portal communication tab shows patient portal messages. Take a screenshot of that. Um, another example, if you choose one of the patient satisfaction CPIAs, and there's quite a few of them, you know, include a sample survey. You know, what, what are you sending to your patients? to assess their satisfaction. Um, and then also, obviously, your, your, your PNPs. Um, you know, what is your, your internal practice policy? When are you sending the satisfaction survey? So um, basically, you're documenting, kind of like the, the security risk analysis ascent, uh, in essence, right? A big part of that SRA is your own personal policies and procedures in your practice. Okay, so that was the, the CPIA or improvement activities um, category. Now, for advancing care information, um, job one, obviously, print a copy of your ACI dashboard, right? Let's make sure we've got a hard copy of that. Um, your security risk analysis, this is where most people fail meaningful use. You've got to keep a copy of that SRA. It needs to be dated within the same calendar year as the reporting period. If your reporting period is, you know, let's say it's going to be the 90 days from October 1st to 1231. Um, you don't have to do the SRA in that time frame, but it does have to be within this calendar year. So your, your 90 days for the calendar year of 2017 might be the, the, the third or fourth quarter, um, but your SRA can be dated any time in 2017, but it has to have a date of 2017 on it. Um, for e-prescribing, print a copy of the e-prescribing measures details report. Um, they want to know that those formulary checks were active. Um, that details report actually shows you there's a column for, um, I want to say there's a column for the eligibility as well as formulary. So all the things that are happening to increment your numerator, um, we actually give you that patient level detail in the details report. I think that would be a great thing to print. Um, you also for e-prescribing, for those of you who are using our EPCS, electronic um, prescribing of controlled substances, they are, um, CMS is flexible on how you count EPCS. You can either count it or not count it, but you have to be consistent. So um, there's an admin setting in Glowstream. Um, if, you, if you choose to include EPCS, you flip that flag. Otherwise, um, anything that's being, um, um, any controlled substances that are being prescribed um, will or will not count based on that. So whatever your policy, 
um, document it and have that be part of your audit folder. Patient electronic access, right? This is the one where you provide folks access to um, the patient portal. And really, you want to have a copy of the CCDA, right? That's the patient's health information that's available to them to view when they go to their portal account. So have a sample CCDA. Um, you want to have a policy regarding your patient access, right? How are you giving patient access? And essentially, um, this is pretty simple, right? Um, as long as you've captured their email address, when you save and close mod and modify a patient, they're getting an invitation. It's, it's as simple as that. And then um, we recommend you follow up with a, a portal welcome letter informing your, your patients of the portal features, including view, download, and transmit, right? We want to make sure they know how to use that. And um, as kind of an extra added bonus, um, by sending that and educating the patient, hopefully they're going to actually click those buttons and your, um, your numerator for VDT is going to increase. So you're, you, you've got something to gain from that as well. Um, we're going to actually, as a thank you for folks um, who attended today, we're going to send out a sample portal welcome letter that we've created um, that we're using successfully at our Q Complete and Q Pro practices. Um, it's got all the hard work done. Um, it's something that can be imported into your patient letters section of your environment. And the liquid links are all in there to make it personal to your practice and your, um, your patients. So um, we'll send that out um, after the webinar. Okay, so HIE. Um, I recommend for this health information exchange, I think the quickest thing, the easiest way to, to document this is just print the HIE quick guide right out of Glowstream. It, should, it, it talks about how do you make this happen? What are you doing? You're, you're referring your provider, your, your patient to another setting of care, and then you're sending electronically a CCDA. Um, and of course, you're gonna already have your CCDA, CCDA printed out. That summary of care is already gonna be uh, printed out for your patient electronic access. So um, those two things should really satisfy. And also a screenshot of your provider outbox showing successful transmission, transmission of that. CCDA to the referral provider. So um, if you go to your, for those of you who hopefully are familiar with direct and the way direct works, um, every provider who has a direct address in Glowstream has an inbox and it's called inbox. And your staff can actually attach themselves to those inboxes because we all know the providers aren't in there working those inboxes because really it's the long-term goal of, of direct is it's gonna replace faxing. So. I log into the inbox, it's just like email, but it's secure transmission from two trusted endpoints. Um, if you log in there and go to your sent, where you have sent, go to the sent folder that shows the, the, the CCDA that you sent via direct, there will be a little, um, a little um, status that tells whether it was sent uh, successfully. I would screenshot that. Um, okay, immunizations and syndromic surveillance. No longer absolutely required, right? These were part of MU. They're they're really optional for MIPS. But if you do, if you if you are participating with either one of these, um, you want to retain your documentation that demonstrates which of the active engagement options you're currently in. So um, just retain that documentation. Okay. Phew. That was a lot. Um, okay. I want to talk about this hardship exemption. Um, this is the first time a participant transitioning to MIPS hardship exemption. All right, what the heck is this? Okay, this is a long, this is a lot of data here. Um, I'm going to try and, and cover it relatively quickly because there's still more to talk about. But um, the bottom line here is if you never, if, if you've never participated in the EHR incentive program, so let's think about what that means, right? I didn't do Medicare, I didn't do Medicaid, um, meaningful use. Um, but but I get it now. MIPS isn't going away, and I really am going to I'm going to jump on the bandwagon, and I'm going to do MIPS. So we've got folks who are new to EMR, um, who've never participated in meaningful use in the past, and they're going to do MIPS this year. And they are going to um, most importantly, they're going to submit ACI data. Right? Let's remember that ACI is sort of the the transition from meaningful use. Right? We inherited ACI from, from MU. It's the, it's the, the MIPS performance category that is close, most closely related to meaningful use. Um, if you are going to do ACI 
in 2017 and you're going to submit data. Gas, but you didn't participate in meaningful use in 2016. Guess what? You can complete this hardship exemption and you won't see the MU penalty in your 2018 payment. Remember this confusing thing where the payment adjustment year or incentive, or I should say the adjustment year is always two years later than the participation year. So if you didn't participate in 2016 and you're thinking, oh, I am, you know, I'm going to see that nasty CO253 on every single Medicare voucher for the rest of my life. You can get rid of that in 2018 if you complete this um, hardship exemption. It has to be submitted by October 1st. So you're going to go to the CMS website. I've got the, um, hopefully we can enable these hyperlinks um, when we send this out. If not, um, you know, just Google hardship exemption and I think you should be able to get to it. I'm going to show you the next screen is, okay, so when I'm on that CMS website, and I'm in that payment adjustment hardship um, portion of the screen. There's a there's two hyperlinks here. Um, one is the hardship instructions, and one is the hardship application. I have truncated my screenshot here because I got so confused looking at this. It says transitioning to MIPS, and then it says decertified EMR. This is not about Glowstream being a decertified EMR. Glowstream is a fully certified EMR. So I don't want you to be confused. It's the same documentation that's used for both hardship exemptions. But we're, we're claiming the one about, I am a first time eligible provider transitioning to the merit-based incentive payment system in program year 2017. So we want you to um, not pay that penalty next year. Don't, don't you know, let's get your, your reimbursements back up to where they need to be for 2016. Um, if, 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 if the MIPS, 2017 year is going to be your first year participating in the EHR incentive program. I think that is a super confusing concept, but um, it's going to spare you from what you didn't do in 2016. Okay. Um, all right. We talked about at the beginning of the call, we talked about the 2018 proposed rule. So I'm going to try and get the, through this pretty fast so we can um, wrap this up. So, what are the changes that are being proposed? The low volume threshold is increasing. So um, currently, if you if you don't bill out 30,000 or 100 patients, you don't have to participate. They're upping that to 90,000. So if you do 90,000, if you do less than 90,000 in Medicaid reimbursables, um, charged allowables, then you will not have to participate in 2018. Or if you see less than 200 patients. Uh, virtual groups, this is a very exciting concept. So for those of you who are single practitioners who are really, you wish you could participate as a group, you can actually band together with non-affiliated um, providers that you know and you become can become a virtual group. Um, CMS is still trying to figure out what that's going to look like and they've actually reached out to the community for some guidance. Hey, tell us how you think it should work. So um, some interesting webinars on that topic. Uh, the submission method, we talked about this already. You're going to be able to use multiple submission mechanisms within a category. We like that. Um, we are excluding the cost category again in 2018. Love that. Um, additional HIE exclusions. Um, if you refer or transfer out fewer than 100 people. So remember, this is something we had for meaningful use that went away. We have no choice. We have to do at least one for MIPS. They're going to reinstate that um, fewer than 100. We like this one as well. You won't have to meet that as part of the base. Um, 2018, 20, um, 2014 edition cert uh, that I have a typo here. Um, it's going to be good enough to use 2014 edition certificate certified product in 2018. Um, previously, you had to be on 15 for the 2018 reporting year. They have they have waived that. Um, however, if you are on 2015 edition cert, you'll get a bonus, which is very nice. There's also going to be a small practice bonus. Um, if you work in a practice with less than 16 providers, you're automatically going to get an additional five points added to your score. Um, this concept of the hierarchical chronic care, I can't remember what HCC stands for. Um, suffice it to say, if you have very complex um, Medicare patients and your HCC risk score is greater than one, you're going to get between one and three bonus points. And there's a quality improvement bonus. This one intrigues me. 
So they're going to be looking at your quality scores that you submit in 17. And if you do better than that in 2018, you're going to get additional quality points. That is really cool. Um, okay, here's some resources. Um, I always like you to know where this data comes from. So a lot of this is from the horse's mouth. Um, go out and, and poke around on the QPP website. And I think we're going to throw it over to Brent to talk about our services. Thank you, Julie. That was all some really good information and very interesting. I know over here at Triarch Health, we're very excited about the quality payment program and value-based care, so much so that we have simplified our, our offerings to our practices. Uh, we really want to partner with our practices to see them thrive and succeed with the quality payment program. By doing so, we've created two different offerings, uh, the first being Q-Complete and the other being Q-Pro. Uh, if Julie moves to the next slide, the differences between the two programs is Q-Pro provides you all of the tools and services that are necessary to be successful in the quality payment program without revenue cycle management. So what does that mean? So it means you receive our performance management, so you are provided a dedicated resource over here who is a subject matter expert in MIPS um, that can provide you expertise and advice, process management, management reporting and meetings, uh, assure tools are being used properly over here, uh, workflow consulting, continuing education, training, quality program consulting, gap analysis and recommendations. Additionally, if you're looking for any kind of analysis or data or analytics that would be helpful to you as a practice, um, as an example, you're looking at maybe bringing a type of machine into the practice or you're doing going to possibly do a new procedure in the practice or you're looking to expand the practice in, into a second or third location. Wouldn't it be nice to have analysis that would support a decision on that, whether or not to do those things? So instead of making decisions by the gut, making decisions by the data. Uh, additionally, provide you with policies, procedures, and materials, and training, so best practice workflows, best practices to engage patients, ongoing training programs, implementation of new workflows, implementation of monitoring of new policies. So helping you create these policies and procedures and providing you the best practices to rolling these out in your practice. And then lastly, giving you the, all the necessary tools uh, that are needed to be successful in these programs. So I know a lot of people during meaningful use, they were upset that you needed additional tack-ons like a portal or direct messaging. What we want to do is rally behind this, be a better partner to you, um, and provide you all these tools and technology that you need to be successful in these programs. So the EMR, our PM system, uh, our cloud environment, which we think is important for everybody to be in, uh, patient portal, lab interfaces, direct messaging, e-patient statements, e-prescribing, online bill pay, and you can choose from all of our current interfaces that we have in production. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Julie. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your territory manager, whether that's myself or Patrick Murphy. If you don't know who that is, please reach out to support and we should be able to help you out. Thanks, Brent. So let's try and summarize um, and talk about, you know, what, what does all this mean? And, and it's, you know, September 13th, my son's birthday. What does this all mean? Where are we going? So if you're a Q Pro or Q Complete customer, um, you're going to continue to receive feedback from us and we'll be here with you when it's time to submit your data. Um, for those of you who've already begun your MIPS journey, you want to continue monitoring quality and ACI, right? Um, definitely get out and, and download the 2017 quality benchmarks from the QPP resource library. Um, this is what helps you understand which decile your percentage score lands you in and that's what ultimately determines your score for that performance category. So the quality performance category is really based on the deciles. Um, you need, you don't need this data for submission, right? Um, when you, when it's time to submit your data, you're going to just submit your data, but they're going to measure you based on those deciles. So if you're trying to know, you know, if you're trying to tweak, oh gee, I, I really need to focus a little bit more on uh, making sure we do tobacco cessation counseling because that measure is falling below, you know, the decile I want it to be in. You need to know what those those deciles are. So get out there and download that 2017 quality benchmarks. Um, for those of you who are Q Pro or Q Complete, we do that translation for you. But um, everybody should get out there and get those benchmarks, and they'll they'll change every year. Um, don't forget about your improvement activities. I think we all focus so much on quality and ACI, we forget. Um, you know, it's it's time. The time is now. Let's kick off that 90-day plan to document and record your improvement activities. Um, and think about group reporting. 
I really think it's going to ease your reporting burden and make you um, make you more successful. For those of you who have not begun, okay, um, it's not too late to avoid the penalty, right? We didn't talk about pick your pace today because we've talked about it before, um, but truthfully, you can avoid penalty. Here are some of the ways you can do that. Report a single quality measure. Pick one and report it. Um, attest to a single, I have another typo here I gotta fix, a single improvement activity, or attest to the ACI base score. Remember we talked about when we looked at the ACI dashboard, you have to do the security risk analysis, you have to do, you know, you have to have one patient who's on the portal, um, you, or you have to invite one patient, provide access to one patient. You have to send one um, summary of care upon transition of care, which requires direct care messaging, and you have to do one e-prescribe, which obviously requires sure scripts. Um, so, and then for everybody, it's not too soon to start planning for 2018, and we are here to help, that's what we do. All right, so here's some contact information at the end. You can get a hold of Brent or Patrick or Mike, um, and that's it, and I think we, miss, we made it. I think we're, it's like 101, isn't it? <gasps> Thanks, you guys. We're going to do more of these, and um, we appreciate you hanging in there with us. We know this is a lot of information, um, but we're here to help. Have a great day. Thank you.